Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you for being here wherever you are in the world. I'm so excited about my guest today, Curtis Childs. I know a lot of you have been asking me to interview him and I finally have. If you don't know who he is, Curtis Childs suffered a period of intense depression that led him to question God and his lifelong interest in Swedenborgian theology. Curtis recovered from his depression with the help of modern medicine, therapy, and a return to the spiritually uplifting messages he found in Swedenborg's writing. Curtis is now applying his education and desire to help others find peace through Swedenborg's insights by producing and hosting a weekly webcast he is happiest when he can use Swedenborg's concepts to help someone solve something they used to think was unsolvable. Curtis has appeared on many international radio shows, podcasts and YouTube shows and has been a regular speaker at conferences. This is his story and this is his passion. Curtis, I'm so honoured to have you on the show. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And it's cool to, to hear that you had some people asking Yes, to have I me on here. I've had quite that a means few. It, good. Well, that means I'm not just showing up and people are like, oh, no, you have the, this guy on this time. So uh, that feels good. <laughs> and th thanks for that introduction. Um, it was like, it's a, like a trip down memory lane for me thinking about, the, yeah, that, my, that first bout with depression and, and how it all started. So it's good for me to get sort of, oh, yeah, right. That's, that's where I am. That's what I'm doing. So it's good. Yeah. And look at, and look at where you are now. Yeah, I've got. I just I'm just getting over like a new bout of depression that I that I just had oh, recently. Really? Yeah, yeah. But I I actually did did a couple of videos about it here. I find that when you know we you think about the the seasonal cycle here. So I'm on the like the east coast of the United States, and it's just been like really cold and really snowy here for for quite a while. You know, a lot of the world goes through those cycles. Everybody goes through the day night cycle. And I find that life does that too. And that I, I don't really like the, the night and the cold when we're in it. But as I come out of that, I'm usually a little bit wiser for it. You know, and I've definitely found that my, my larger periods of growth accompany the, <laughs> the least pleasant times uh, in my life. So it's, it's like a, a silver lining. There are so many exciting topics I want to cover with you, but I just feel <laughs> since you brought up the depression and it's such a so prevalent in our society, do you find the more that you, I don't even know, the, the turn, the more you evolve and connect with yourself that your bouts of depression, you're, over, you're able to overcome them quicker? That, that's a great question. And it's one that, that I mull over myself because you know, in, in that introduction to me, it was saying what I'm trying to do is help people solve problems in their lives. And that's what excites me about all the spirituality stuff and Swedenborg's in particular is, well, anybody, as soon as you have experienced suffering of some kind and all of us, you know, experience different kinds, you, you want to help people not go through that. It's just a natural human instinct to like, I want to find a, the cure for whatever I just went through. And I would say that absolutely, even, even if I can't make the negative periods in my life not happen or shorter, per, I, perhaps so, what I think I can really do with the tools that I have is make them more useful. Make it so that when I'm in them, I'm getting more out of them. So that when I come back out, I've gained more empathy, more insight, and I've and and I've those experiences. I've, I've been able to take that opportunity to make some of these spiritual concepts, which were maybe theoretical to me before. Now that I've needed them in the trenches, they they become real to me. And once they're real, they're this new source of inspiration and comfort. And it's just like some kind of intense training program. So I haven't quite mastered. It, well, it's, it's impossible to know because it, I go long periods in between. Maybe I would have been having a lot more depression without all this stuff. It's, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a nice clean answer to that. But I do think, yeah, that, that it's definitely made it, mitigated it to an extent and certainly made me understand the context better and get more out of it. And I find whenever I share my stories of what I'm going through personally, that's often what resonates with people really strongly. So that that's like a, a use 
in it right there is just um, being able to say to people, yeah, a lot of us, a lot of us struggle with that. And I love that, I don't want to term it bad, but I love how you're transforming your experiences of depression into something really positive and also to help others. Yeah, well, it's it feels nice, right? And I think anybody who has had some kind of struggle in their life, oh, everybody's had some kind of struggle in their life, when you can take something that at the time seemed meaningless, and it seemed it seemed chaotic and it seemed upsetting and you just uh, it's just painful and confusing to be able to turn that into something that you organize that you can see make a difference in the next person's life it's a real catharsis it really mm-hmm. makes you feel like okay that it, there something came out of it it was a little more worth it for me so being able to do that when i've been fortunate enough to do that it feels really good it feels really good to say, okay, well, at least it wasn't all for nothing, you know, or we're getting something out of it. It's, it's, it's fantastic that you're exploring that. So someone who's experiencing depression, what is your advice? Um, get help. Okay. You're, the, the worst mistake I feel like I've made is um, getting more and more isolated when you have depression because it's the the more that you can get outside your it's it's your mental processes that cause that in the first place so it's trying to solve it with those same mental processes is really difficult and there's just so many things that reaching out to people can do for you and, and in so many different ways um just just having people that you can talk to about it and is is, is a huge deal and also consider it holistically like i would when I was in that first bout of depression, I really was thinking, okay, well, I have spiritual stuff. So all I need is this spiritual stuff. And then I won't, I just got to double down on that and really, really do it. And then I won't be depressed anymore, but it's, we're holistic beings, right? We have, we have so many layers to us. And if there's something off about you physically, you've got to address that as well. If, if you're missing, you know, a certain amount of support or emotional support or you've got some past traumas or something you gotta you gotta you can't just put your blinders on and say well i've got this one spiritual method that's gonna make it so that i can i can power through this uh i think that we we're we've got a lot of layers to us and the best is to yeah the spiritual can lead you and it can be that compass and it can help you in ways that other things can't but the other things are essential too. So you want to do it as a package. You want to be led, led by this, this, these higher principles, but, at, but making sure you're checking those boxes lower down. And initially you're not going to know how to check those boxes, which is why you got to reach out to people. Yeah. You got to learn from people who have, who have been there and people do care about you. And, and your things are, are not as bad as they seem. This is like universally true. So other people can tell you that even when you don't see it for yourself. Great message. And that segues us onto Swedenborg, who has had helped you profoundly. Who, who, who was he and what are his uh, theology? Sure. Um, well, Swedenborg used to be, he lived quite a long time ago. So this is mid 1700s was when he really started doing a lot of publishing that we're doing here. Um, but he was a person like everyone else. So he had a life that he was going through and Initially, he was just very smart, very successful polymath. So he was inventing a bunch of stuff. He was mastering all the scientific disciplines of his day. He was involved in this Swedish government. Yeah, Swedenborg lived in Sweden. Okay. And he would he was what they call like a Renaissance person and very, very much seemed like he had a good trajectory going, but he hit his own rough patch in life. He had his own dark night of the soul, which actually you can read every detail of because he he did this fascinating thing where he started to catalog his dreams when he was around in his mid fifties. And this is like pre Freud, there's not really psychology back then, but he, he goes in and he's describing all of his dreams and describing what he thinks they mean. And he wrote it in this journal, which has since been published. So you can read it kind of step by step. And it's like the, a larger world opened up to him. So he had always been somebody who was, despite his scientific leanings, really interested in 
the things of spirituality and religion. He was, do, he was one of the foremost anatomists in the world, but he was also looking for the seat of the soul in the body. Actually, when he would look back on his, his scientific career after he made this switch into theological or spiritual or whatever you want to call, call this sort of second <laughs> act to his life, he would look back on the first act of his life where he mastered all these different disciplines, you know, engineering and, and, and um, sciences of all kinds. And he would say that, that that was the foundation that he had to have to be able to understand this next stuff, the spiritual stuff. So just like I was saying before, we're holistic beings. It's not just, well, you can go, go and play around with your science and how the world works. I'm just gonna look at what's spiritual. They're, they're connected and you got it. to understand the physical helps us understand the spiritual. So he was going through this. He cared about the spiritual stuff, but then he's, he started to hit this crisis of, of epic proportions. And it, essentially what started as vivid dreams got more and more intense and started to become what we would now call spiritual experiences. And from there, you know, uh, he described it as his spiritual eyes were opened and he began to have 30 years worth of at, at will spiritual experiences. Wow. So he could, you know, like now we'll talk about a near death experience, mm -hmm. which is, it will be triggered by somebody having some kind of horrific event or being around someone who's transitioning, something like that. And you'll have an event and, and it'll be really profound and life, life altering. But Swedenborg was, was having that kind of contact every day. And he, he, he started a new journal called his Journal of Spiritual Experiences, where he just, for, for years and years and years, just talks about what he encountered that day, you know, and what he learned about this, how the, the spiritual side of life and how that influences the physical. And to try to say, oh, here's what he wrote about is really hard because he wrote about everything. And I really think almost every area of life fits into this spiritual framework that he described, but he, he totally shifted his traje trajectory and stopped publishing his scientific works. He would still do a few papers here and there, but mainly shifted into, he felt like I've got this message to bring to people about the, the other side of life and how the, the fact that we live in a, a reality that is both physical and spiritual affects us, that the nature of who we are, the nature of God, uh, the why human mental processes happen like they do, the way that the divine organizes life, why bad things happen to good people, and then some sort of revision and reform of Christian theological principles, because he was in the, the Christian tradition and he thought it, he, he was asserting that it had strayed from its, its original mission and he was trying to introduce people to how harmful certain ideas could be if they are applied without love behind them. And, and then everything in between, he was ta talking to people who had died, you know, and were in the afterlife. This is, he became sort of famous for that. He, there was a time when there's a, a number of anec famous anecdotes about him very publicly being able to know things he couldn't have known. And you just look on Wikipedia, that mm -hmm. stuff is there. And it was just this amazing deep dive where he, he just got what I feel like is this unparalleled amount of information about the rest of life and wrote it all down and was, was used to writing really complex things very carefully and used his scientific process in mind to release like 17 volumes that just carefully cataloged the, everything you'd want to know about, about spiritual reality. And I have found that to be my best friend as I go through life, the, the world he describes in there is everything. It's everything you wish life was that, that it, it takes this confusing, strange sh outer shell that we experience as life here in the physical world. And it gives you a reason for why things happen. And it gives you a focus in, in how to effectively live your life. And it gives you hope for where the human race can head. And it, it is also this thing that just, you know, he's, he's some guy that, that lived a long time ago and I don't know him. And, but yet the principles that I find in there, when I'm in my darkest times, that's, it's like, that's what those set me free in there. And so I've experienced that. And I'm my little part I can do for, for the human race is to make that accessible to anyone else who might benefit from it. Well, thank you. You're certainly a passionate and, and and very inspiring. I can't wait to have a look at some of his journals. Have you read the 17 volumes? 
Yeah, I think so. I I don't, <laughs> I never set out to read, here's number one, here's number two, here's number three, but I'm reading his set all the time. So I've, I've, I'm, I don't, I don't know if I've covered every bit of it, but I'm just always like, I always have the, his books around everywhere and every day I'm reading them and in them. So every once in a while, I'll come across something that I feel like I haven't read before, but I wouldn't trust that either because the, with the way that, that his stuff is, because it's all, there's so much new to it. You can, there can be something that you've read many times and it just doesn't really stick out to you, but you have some life experience or understand something differently. And then you go back and read it and you realize, oh, that's what that is. Like that's real. And then, so I'll go read books. I remember one time I was reading over his most popular book, Heaven and Hell for a presentation I had to make. And I thought I've read this multiple times. So this will be an easy presentation. And I just felt like I don't know if I've ever read this because I was looking at it with this new eyes. So, so I don't, I'm not, I don't know. Have I read all the books? I, I don't know. Nobody knows that. <laughs> Great answer. And in each moment, each day you're a different person. So you're going to have a different experience of reading the book. Right. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. I know you've done talks on this about his philosophies. The first one is uh, you've talked about what it feels like to die. What does yes. it feel like to die? It's not so bad. Uh, so, well, and you can go, you can go to the, any account of a near death experience and you can get what is, what is a really crucial principle, which is that just because something looks horrific doesn't mean it is for the person who's going through it. I mean, how many of us, when we feel despair about life being this cruel, unfair thing. How many of us are thinking, well, what about these people that die in these horrible ways? And we think about the suffering that they must be going through. And I was once interviewing uh, a paramedic who was a, you know, on an ambulance for his career or for a long time and would go to all these you know, horrific accidents. And he said that for the little things, yeah, people are feeling it, but the really big tragic things that people go through almost invariably either they don't remember it or they had some kind of spiritual experience when they're having it so it's it's this principle that Swedenborg carries through when he talks about the dying process and he says that he didn't have a traditional near-death experience in that he was had some accident and was it was was disrupted physically and so so did that but he he describes in detail in two, two different places. I think it's the same experience he's talking about in two different books. The, where he was, he says he was shown what the dying process is like, but he says, I was placed in a state where I was still conscious enough. I'm paraphrasing. I was still conscious enough to be able to remember what I was going through, but I would, but my body was shutting down like, like somebody would shut down if they were, if they were dying. And he talked about this really gentle progression that he went through. So Initially, he could just feel like a, a shutting down of his physical senses and a quieting of his breathing, right? like, like somebody's body who's, who's slowing down. He, he could start to feel a really, um, really subtle spiritual breath, though. He asserted that you've got a physical body and you've got a spirit. And your spirit is in every, not just in your body in general, but it's in every little part of your body. So it has the same characteristics and shapes and it does the same functions albeit on a spiritual level rather than a physical level. And we could get into what that, what he means by that later. But you could, he said he started to feel like a pull, like a drawing out from the body. And initially the state of mind that he was in was really more a state of heart that you're just down to the core things that you love and, and believe in and not a lot of intellectual activity going on. And he, he talked about being surrounded by angels during this and to him what he mean what he means when he says angels is this is somebody who was like you or i at one point but now is in the life after death mm -hmm. and is just um really like all the spiritual growth where we're trying to go through they're, they're like in the master class so they, they're just really the most loving wise people you can imagine you just think about who who's got this and he said that that's the sweet spot it's like somebody who really like think if, if you're going to go to a 
doctor because you have something you need to get taken care of. It's nice if the doctor is really kind, but if they don't really know how to help you, that doesn't do it. If the doctor knows their stuff, but doesn't care about you and isn't taking the time to listen to you, that's not really going to help. The, the thing you really love is when, when you can tell this, oh, this person cares and is really competent at the same time. So this is love and wisdom together. So he had these, what do you call the heavenly angels or the, the most like heart love centered angels around him as he's in this state. And he could feel them almost like shepherding or, or curating his thoughts so that nothing disturbing would reach him while he's in this vulnerable state of transitioning into the afterlife. And he says that as he began to stir from that, he moved into a state uh, that he called the spiritual state, which is where you're starting to sort of wake up and be able to think a little more and start to look, look around and use your physical senses. He said that then there was this different kind of angel, he called them spiritual angels that came in. And that's where he said, it seemed like a covering was rolled off of his left eye and that gave him the use of his spiritual sight. So that's what we call our channel off the left eye. That, that came out of that, oh, okay. that story. Yeah, a funny story is I, when I was starting the YouTube channel 10 years ago, long time ago, I was just, I, I was like, okay, I'll start a YouTube channel about Swedenborg stuff. Nobody knows what a Swedenborg is. I don't know, we wanna name it something that might be interesting and but not gonna scare anyone away. So I just started looking through one of his books and that phrase was there and I thought, oh, that's cool. And so we stuck with it. It's a good but, name. Yeah, it's fun. And it has a lot of meaning because also like the, the everything with Swedenborg about the human body, there's a deep significance in it. So the left eye, you know, the sight corresponds as he would say to, to understanding. So just like physically, if you want to understand your environment, you look around. Mm -hmm. So spiritually, our spiritual sight is the way that we understand life. So there's an analogous role to the, the spiritual part of us in sight. So to have in the left side, Swedenborg actually preempted the modern brain science understanding of like the hemispheres. So to him, the, the left side was this intellectual thing. So to pull a cover off of the left side is like getting used, seeing things clearly, you know, understanding things as, as they really are. So on the channel, we're trying to help give people the option to, to use some of these tools to try to do that. And so it's, I, I really like it as a, and it's the left side, the right side is the volitional, like the emotional side. We can't make anyone care about anything. We can just equip you with the tools. And then you go out there and, and take the action and do the stuff in the world. So Swedenborg was waking up, ha had that. And he talks about um, after that, you just meet with a lot of love and care. Everybody does. doesn't matter who you are or what your religion was or, or whether you, uh, lived a great, uh, a kind life or an unkind life. Initially, everybody is is deeply cared for and, and given every comfort and hospitality. And then it's up to us. I mean, up to what we really love and care about. If if we love, um, if we love people and we love caring and we love service and community, we want to stay around that. If we love uh, material gain and and um, being superior to other people we don't want to be around that but the next steps are where we go and what we do is is up to us but the initial process is this really careful really thoughtfully curated um, transition I guess is, is a little overused but transition um, from from one life into another and you've talked about this before but heaven and hell is there a heaven and a hell yeah. I mean, his most popular book is called Heaven and Hell, but I think it's a, it's a lot, what he means by that is a lot different than what most people would think of as heaven and hell. And this is something you'll find if you spend time in Swedenborg's material is that he'll have a lot of concepts that sound familiar and have superficial similarities to the, the traditional understanding of them, but are actually quite different. So everything spiritual is starts with a state of mind. So the physical world is structured by physical laws, right? That's why everything is the way it is, gravity and whatever. I'm not a physicist, but mm -hmm. we all know that it's structured by those sorts of things. But the spiritual world is structured by spiritual laws and the spiritual part of us is the part that thinks and feels the conscious part of us, according to Swedenborg, is the spirit. So everything there 
is based around the kind of stuff you experience in your heart and your mind. So if you talk about heaven and hell as places, the places there only exist because of places inside the heart and mind, like sort of here, like your surroundings can make you feel a certain way there, how you feel makes your surroundings a certain way, if that makes sense. So heaven is a state of loving usefulness is how he describes it, which is not that elegant of a way of saying you love to help. So if you think about doing something constructive, something that you know makes a difference for somebody, that feeling, and we've all had flashes that, that feeling where I'm like, for, for example, you're doing this show because you, we want to inspire people's passion, right? And, and, mm-hmm. and knowing that inspiring their passion is going to make them happy and not only make them happy, but it's going to make them able to go out and do something good for the world. That's going to make other people happy. And so that, that feeling, if you, if you can hear, you know, hear back from somebody who writes you in and say, you helped inspire my passion or, you know, there's, if somebody writes into my channel and says, this is really great. There's two ways that I can take that. There's a heavenly way and a hellish way mm-hmm. I can take that. So the heavenly way is I'm thinking, wow, am I glad that person is happy? Cause I know what it's like to, to need a little bit of extra help. And, and I'm just thinking about their life being better. And that's exciting. That can really be exciting. Yeah. Right? So that is heaven. That feeling is heaven. And you can, that can be, you know, developed in all of us and brought out to where that's like the primary joy of your, your life is whatever your role in society or the world is knowing I'm going out and helping people. And that's exciting. It's not the only thing I love, but it's the most, it's the thing I love the most. It's like the thing that's driving me and everything else like, well, my, my, how much I love my own reputation or how much I love sensory gratification that's there, but it's, it's lower down. It's not what's driving me. Hell is the opposite of that. Uh, Hell is when if I, if I, if somebody writes in and says, Curtis, this was really good. It makes me think like, well, look at, look at that. Look at how great I am. Look at how much better I am than this person who's writing in and needs, needs that help. Um, that's the beginning of it. Right. And, and um, if, if what I care about is myself and, and, and like not myself, but like my eminence or, or me being greater than other people, that's the beginning of it. Swedenborg also describes it as when, when the pleasure of evil is felt as good, that's hell. Like when we enjoy harming people, when we enjoy degrading people, using people, anything like that, that is what he calls hell, right? And so in the afterlife, what you love, because so broadly he'll say either you love helping and and doing good to people or you just care about your own interests and you see people as disposable or whatever what you love is like gravity spiritually so here why do things come together it's because of gravity i've just been watching this great show about the universe with with my family and it's so cool how (laughs) how these 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 weird laws that we sort of understand you can explain everything by them right so spiritually there's the same kind of principles, but they have to do with, you know, what's in the heart and mind. So there love is like gravity. So if you love a particular thing that draws you toward other people that love that same thing. So people who love serving the common good and love the idea of making other people happy, they gravitate together. And when you get a bunch of those people together, it sounds like heaven to me. You yeah. think about if, if you, if you like, a, you know, you're driving along the highway and you got to take an exit and you know that everybody in this town you're about to go into, what they care about the most is making sure that, they, that honesty and fairness and, and, and justice and, and love uh, are felt by everyone. I would feel really good going into that town, right? So then on the, the other hand, if, if what you care about the most is uh, if you have like sort of a, an ego maniacal desire to control other people and be, be, have them praise you and be better than them. Okay. If, if, if you've got that going on, it's not that fun to be around you then. And if it's a bunch of other people, you're naturally attracted to a bunch of other people that are in that same state and love that same thing. Well, that's the hellish experience because it's just, you have to, you have to be around other people that are like you. And if, if you're in that state, of course, it's going to make it 
it's going to make it you it's not going to have nearly the potential for joy that that love does um so there's a little there's a quick description of <laughs> heaven and hell thank you for that and it's so individual but it is a projection of our consciousness um and one thing might be great for you and not for another everyone is individual I've heard about this, uh, many, of us, many, of the, many of the viewers have heard about this. Is there a life review, according to Swedenborg? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have, I learned about life reviews first from near-death experiences. Yeah. And initially I wouldn't have pieced together that that's in Swedenborg because he doesn't call it a life review. But if you start looking at his descriptions, because he has, he has so many descriptions of afterlife scenarios and phenomena out there, but you do come across all the elements that make up a life review. So he, there's this thing called the spiritual memory. So ev like everything physical has a spiritual counterpart to it. And so does your memory. Like you, our memories here are not that, that good. Like I, I forget a lot of stuff. And, so do I. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I actually... You know, my, I have a, a daughter who's five and she was just worrying about that she's not gonna remember some things that she's doing now when she grows up because she doesn't remember what some things she did when she was a baby, you know? And she was really getting sad about this. And, and I actually have had my own upset about this, you know, in, in my life that you just feel like, is, are these little moments and these precious little things that you go through, are they just gonna be gone? And, and it seems like they are because your physical memory just gets worse and worse and you, you forget things. And, but there's a spiritual, there's a spiritual memory inside of you that is just like tinfoil. You know, if you touch tinfoil, it never, you, you never get that wrinkle out. It's everything you've ever done. Every little bit of every part of your life is in that spiritual memory. And um, Swedenborg talks about that the, the spiritual memory in the afterlife can be called back at will. He talks about people who had written books, uh, and, and every word of those books was able to be represented in front of them. People brought back into uh, memories of their childhood. People who had, on the negative side, people who had committed some crime and uh, against someone and, and were saying, oh, I never did that. that. That can be you know brought right out in front of you. But everything there is, is there. In Swedenborg, he does say every state of life that we have returns. And I couldn't, what is he talking, what, what do you mean every state? But once I started reading about these near-death experiences in the life review, I was like, oh, that's what he's talking about. Every state of life that we have returns. So it's it's not only that you, you look back and review your life, but all the parts of you that you're building up throughout life become this, this part of who you are. That there's in, that, you know, the, the, the things that I loved and understood when I was younger, somehow, and I don't know exactly how, become more and more a part of your, your, your total now consciousness where it's, it's really this like whole, whole um, the, all the good work, all the hard work we do at every age somehow comes into this sort of consciousness that we have now. And like you were talking about depression, they're all experiences to learn and grow. What are Swedenberg's view on reincarnation? We did a show called Do We Reincarnate? where we broke down the answer to this question. And with Swedenborg, I feel like it's always complicated. And reincarnation is a complicated answer. I would say on the, he didn't ever talk about people being, going into the afterlife and then coming and living another physical life. But a lot of the primary principles of reincarnation as I've had it described, he talks about the, those processes playing out in the spiritual world. So <laughs> he'll talk about people who, um, even angels, like I was talking about before, them kind of getting let down into states where they don't quite remember who they used to be and undergoing more growth and that sort of thing. Like people will talk about reincarnation, us coming back here to learn again, but he'll say that that happens within a loop there. He will also talk about um, a, a different take on, you know, a lot of people will talk about having 
uh, memories of things that they never, you know, in previous lives that they never lived. And he, his explanation is what he calls heredity or spiritual heredity that, um, well, there's actually two aspects to it. One is spiritual heredity that just like you have physical genes that are passed on, you know, you can, you can go back and look up your ancestry and yeah. say, okay, that this is why, you know, I, I, I'm always cold is because my ancestors came from somewhere warmer or something like that. Um, he says that we have spiritual traits that are passed along as well. And actually spiritual issues that we can be working on can actually, you can be working on the same hereditary tendencies that, you know, your, your grandmother or grandfather had. So it's actually, you know, if you think about that, that, you know, the Indigo Girls song, it's like from another and another lifetime. Anyway, I won't sing the whole song. <laughs> like a generational but, impact. Yeah. Yeah. You can have a generational impact and, and it, you can really be actually making it better for the next generation because you can decrease, you know, what you're passing along. Then he also talks about, and this is like a whole can of worms, but he talks about that all of us have a body and a spirit, right? So the body, well, where's the body? The body's in somewhere. Like right now I'm in a room here. And even though we're, I'm not we around. Think, we, we think we are. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. Um, and my, the body's somewhere. So where's the spirit? Well, the spirit is somewhere. Just like the body's somewhere in the physical world, the spirit's somewhere in the spiritual world, like in a, in a location. And that we're, we're really like in a neighborhood of some kind there. And that actually the, the kind of people, the spirits that your spirit is around can influence the, the kind of thoughts and feelings that you have. Because just like here, we are influenced by the kind of people we interact with. You think about people that you know and have yes. conversations with and how those conversations change your mind about things how you sort of, when you approach a situation, you think of how your friend might do it. Well, we're getting influenced by our sort of spiritual companions as well. And he talked about e even at times us being able to share memories with them. So to him, it, it was like, this is a, 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 a demonstration of just how close the spiritual world is to us. So that, that's a short answer. Yeah, again, we have a program uh, that you can check out called um, Do We Reincarnate? Um, if you want to hear a little more about our full investigation into that. That'd be great. And we'll continue. But for everyone that's listening or watching, all your details will be in the show notes so everyone can look at that. What? So what do we do in the afterlife? Yeah, better not just be uh, only playing <laughs> harps. That, that would be cool for a day. Hanging Actually, out. Yeah. Well, so, so Swedenborg begins one of his books with this story about what he calls the false heavens. So there was a lot of people who had a lot of ideas about what they felt like heaven would be. What, what would heaven be to them? And a lot, some of them had been informed by, you know, their religious upbringing or just had these ideas. And some people thought, well, heaven to me would be like just feasting with like religious figures and, and just having this amazing conversation while we're while we're eating and it would just be that eternally some people thought well heaven is you just worship forever you're in a you're in some great certain you're just glorying with god some people thought well it's just it's socializing like it's high-end socializing you just got leisure time whatever people's ideas of what they thought heaven would be like and instead of people getting there and some some angel or god is telling them well you're wrong they got to go try it they everybody got to go and 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 some people thought in their thought well heaven would be being the the ruler of everyone like i would be a king you know and that would be like heaven so he talks tells this story of everybody getting to go try it and people do it and after a few days they're they're pounding on the doors like get get me out of here because the problem with all those ideas is none of them have usefulness in them if you're just if you're just feasting all day you're not doing anything for anyone if you're just um, it's actually the variety in life and the the cause and the knowledge you're doing something that makes heaven nothing nothing else can really be a, a perpetual joy so heaven the the spiritual world that swedenborg described is both remarkably similar to the world we're in and like strikingly different so the similar parts is that he talked about an existence that you would recognize 
from where we are, meaning you're a person there. You still have a form. It's a, you know, it looks a little different, but, but it looks like recognizably human, um, just looks better. And you have, you even are able to like, able to use all your senses. Like you look around, you hear things, you walk. And this is something that a lot of people, I think the today are more sort of intuitively thinking, I think with the rise of things like near death experiences and things, but in his day, that wasn't, there was quite a lot of people who thought, you know, you wouldn't have any sensory in, input or anything. So uh, it, it talks about, you know, people in communities and in cities and towns. And he talks about people with vocations and jobs. And he talks, he talks about um, people yeah, having, having religious rituals and practices. And he talks about people doing hobbies and leisure and a lot of this stuff that that is like what we're doing here, but there, there are these fundamental differences with the spiritual world as well, that yeah, there's no time and space there. There is only state and appearance. So right now you can be on a vacation and it's over before you want it to be over, right? Because your state mm -hmm. and what's happening don't match. Your state of mind, it doesn't match. The but energy there, and the matter. Yeah, right. So there everything syncs up um people are able to travel you know there's there's like it's actually a travel instantaneously thought brings presence so if you think about somebody uh that that can bring them right to you and you can you can speak it's actually remarkably like the internet is starting to make the world like right now you and i can have this conversation across a huge amount of distance because we're brought together by a common interest Right, the the the, the, the intervening physical isn't isn't there in the same way. I actually wrote a paper about that when I was in college, that uh, Swedenborg's spiritual world shares so many characteristics with the internet, which obviously there's no analog to when he was writing. So um, I guess it's it's hard if you say what's the what's the afterlife like? What do we do? So much stuff, but hopefully that gives you sort of an <laughs> idea. You, you of, have condensed it. Well, I know we don't have well. We have time in this world, so I know we don't have a huge amount of time, <laughs> but thanks. That was great. Um, this is a popular subject, soulmates, and you've talked about this. What, do, what, what are his views on soulmates? Yeah, Swedenborg has this phenomenon that he calls um, amor conjugialis. Everything he wrote was in Latin, by the way. So as if it wasn't complicated <laughs> enough, La Latin at the time was the language like the universal language mm -hmm. and if so if you wanted to reach a lot of it, very not nearly as many people could read back then so you, you're but if you want to read a reach a broad swath of the educated part of europe you'd write in latin so he wrote in latin and so we're, we're always there's a the dual job translation job of one taking his latin neo-latin words which is no longer a functioning language and translating them into English or whatever language you're speaking, but, and then trying to understand what they mean. So, uh, so with that as a preface, amor conjugialis is sometimes translated conjugal love, sometimes translated married love, but I think it syncs up well with the modern concept of a soulmate, or uh, we've done some shows where we call it that. This is like, think about all the, all the, romantic dreams that the human race has about how great it can be to find somebody that completes you and all that. And this is Swedenborg saying, oh yeah, that, that totally exists. And he talks about this bond that's possible that because he talks about two people becoming one and people being prepared throughout their life for their partnership with, without their knowing it really like you could make a lot of Disney movies about it. Like it is right. very, uh, very much, um, very a happy much happy ending. <laughs> a happy ending, right? And but also um, has some key components to it. Uh, he he talks about that there's. It's not something that you can just that you can just um, have just because you're together with somebody. There's there's got to be um, this mutual respect and desire to to be together. There has to. There can't be any. Um, any dominance of one person over the other. So if one person is like calling all the shots and the other person just kind of following that, that kills it. Um, it has to be based on this actually friendship first. And then from that into 
all the romantic stuff. And it's something that he says can get better and better forever. And that that is like the essence of beauty and love, actually all the other beauty and love that we experience comes out of that. Like that, that is this core thing. And it, it's actually a reflection of everything is about love and wisdom, as I was talking about before. And the, there's these two great components of God, which is yeah, love and wisdom, or you could call them the substance and form. There's this, always this joining of two things is like the, the divine design. And so it's also like, like the divine joins with the human race. So two people that really love each other can be in an image of this great joining. It's like, it's this, this like sort of smallest unit of that. And so that's part of why there's so much power in it. So, and he, he, he writes about it quite a lot. Um, and there's, there's um, yeah, definitely something to, that, that is exciting to think about that, that there's that potential for a, for a human life. Mm. And so in summary, what, what does he surmise is what is the meaning of it all? What is our purpose here on earth or in, in human form in the physical? Yeah. Way? Yeah. Right. So there's a couple of places where he'll lay out. This is why everything exists. And there's, one of them is, he says, God created the universe so that usefulness could exist. That was what I was talking about before, this usefulness, this ability to help. If you look at, which sounds like a strange thing, but then if you start to step back and look at what life is like, it starts to come into a little bit more focus because the world is a little bit confusing. Why, why is there so much negativity in it? Why is there so much hardship in it? It doesn't seem to be designed for the, for the most happiness possible to exist, right? At least this, this level that we're in. Yeah. But I do see a lot of opportunity to be useful. If part of what, because there's so, because we need help, there is such a thing as helping. And, and because there's right and wrong, you can make this choice to do what's right. So in one sense, what we're doing here in the world is choosing what we love. And he writes at the beginning of his book, Divine Love and Wisdom, love is our life. What you care about, what your primary purpose is, what your primary goal is, that really makes you who you are. Like that forms the substance of your soul. And throughout our life, we're really choosing what do we love? And not what do we love like, oh, I love music, but more in a broader sense, you know, do, do I love, can, can I come to love this, this being useful? And you do that through all the different things that you love. So life is a long process of allowing us to shed, if we want it, we, we, we have the opportunity to see the difference between selfish, e egotistical, harmful stuff and, and good, loving, beneficial stuff and getting to choose. Like both of them give us joy. Right? You can get joy out of either one, but which one do you want? Right? And, and us to really understand what it is to, to, to love people. Uh, so the, the point of life is to try to develop a taste for, for doing good things and, and find your joy in being useful and, and cultivate it. So you're finding your passion and just you know making sure that that passion is doing something that, that really helps somebody that's that's the point of life um and the, the rest is all to support that that's great you could be like the passion ambassador <laughs> <laughs> no no i i think that that job is already being you, done you've well. got your own path but so how, how did he detail or explain how we're able to tap more into our spiritual side i know you mentioned before the left eye but did he offer some tools that you can talk about mm -hmm. It, not a not a lot of tools for, for the amount that he wrote it's interesting because he yeah he spiritual experiences were absolutely fundamental to his being able to assemble the knowledge that he assembled but the the view of life that he gives is and what's important in life and how you go about um creating the best spirit in you that you can is accessible to anyone, whether or not you can have spiritual experiences. It's really much more about 
a, a, you know, a lot of nuance and detail around, you know, the golden rule. But he is, as far as like his processes and how he was able to travel out of body and do those sort of things, they're few and far between. I know he did a lot of work. He, he definitely would, cared about breathing and, and the, the different kinds of respiration would lead to different sorts of states. He talks about meditating on various topics. He'll say, I would, he'll say, I was meditating in the morning on the idea of, oh, we, there's one where he says on the ideal of married, married love. And from that, he starts to have this spiritual experience where he gets led by this angel into going and seeing in the spiritual world where there's these people who are deep in that love and, and what it's like. So he will have these sort of trigger experiences he, would, he had a garden that he kept, and it seemed that he had a number of his, he would, he would often sort of have his experiences back there, but he's pretty, pretty short on details of how to engage that process. I think to him, he saw life as such a holistic thing that, that you know, we can be doing this core important work, whether we're having spiritual experiences every day, or whether we're, we've never had one, you can still be as tuned into the real, the, the core spiritual thing, which is learning to love what's good and true but that's that's what the, the spirit is so i you know it'd be nice if we had a few more easy step one two threes from him but but he doesn't quite give us that uh, well being of service is a great tool anyway yeah it leads down, you down a lot of roads um i've asked so many questions is there something you'd like to talk to the passion harvest audience about hmm. oh well yeah Yay. There's a lot of, there's a lot of <laughs> things that, that I'd love to um, talk to them, talk to you Good. all about. Um, I would say life is always better than you think it is. I think about it like a house where sometimes when I would get sort of down and really like it was deep into winter here and I'm struggling with that. Uh, I would think of, I would go, go and look at like, oh, what if I had a, a house that was like on a tropical island and I could look out and see this amazing view all the time, then I would be happy. Um, don't forget the view inside, which is that um, everything that seems like chaos is actually very, very carefully ordered. And that includes your own life that divine providence, which is this is this guidance of everything that Swedenborg talks about it is absolutely, he says in every single detail. So nothing that happens is ever allowed to happen without it leading you towards the happiest possible outcome for you. And the only limit to how happy we are going to become is, you know, if, if we, open up to more and more to, to this kind of good love that I was talking about. Cause I know I've been plagued by fears in my life of, well, did I miss out on this thing? Cause I didn't do that. What if, am I, am I just not as cool a person as other people? So they're going to have a happier life than me. Did I make all these mistakes? That's not, that's not how life is. Um, we, we always have, everything is being carefully taken care of. Just think about when you're reading a story and the protagonist has these struggles you know it's going to turn out well, but the protagonist doesn't know that at the time. So that that really is how life is for us. That the, the actual job we have is very simple, even though it seems very complex. Really, the simple thing is just, um, you know, whenever you can, try to love usefulness and try to push away stuff that's against usefulness, and and know that everything that seems like chaos is actually is actually working to make life better because it's teaching you something, even though the lessons are not fun to learn. I'm not trying to say that life isn't really difficult at times and in that you're not going to have times when you just feel like, no, there's nothing good that could come out of this. I don't believe in any of that. That's fine. Um, but in the end it is. And, and I've gone through a lot of those peaks and valleys myself. And the coolest thing that exists is these little moments I get when I realize, oh, everything's going to be okay. And everything is going to be okay. And, and that's just the truth. So I think that's good for us to hold with us as we work through all kinds of difficult times. But, but it's really just, that's why I love the spiritual stuff in the first place, because it's carrying that message within it. Everything that seemed like it's, it's a loss and that, that we're never going to recover from this. No, you will. Like everything is going to be all right. So that's what I would want to say. That's such a beautiful, comforting message what a what a light you are in the world i've got one more question can i ask sure. one more question uh, yeah yeah <laughs> did he talk about the future 
Yeah. Not, not in a ton of deep, well, not in a ton of detail, like in the year 2025, this thing is going to happen, but he talked about what he calls the new church. Swedenborg uses, like I said, he'll use words like heaven and hell, but they're different than what you think. Mm -hmm. He also, his word church is very different than what you think. He talked about church all the time. He uses the word in a bunch of different meanings, but like fundamentally it, a church is a state of heart and mind. So you think about all the stuff in you that is good and true. So all of your principles, that your good principles that you believe in and that you follow, and then all of your desires or inclinations to help and do things, all of your, all of your good feeling, all that together is the church in you, right? Because this is, this is that, that part of you that looks to, to the divine through whatever way. He also will use it collectively to talk about like a church is like an era of human understanding. So he'll talk about the earliest church that the human race had, but it doesn't mean a single religious institution or even a single religious culture, but it's a certain way of, of loving and believing that the human race had. And he talks about these, there's these big phases that we've gone through, the, the earliest church, he talks about what he calls the most ancient church and the ancient church, and then he goes on through more recent ones. And he says that we've had these eras where people had this really great, this really, I ideal spiritual configuration where initially life was how you think it would be where everybody had regular spiritual experiences and, and revelatory dreams. And when you died, it was just really peaceful. And you knew, right. That you just knew that the person was going on and they could talk to you. It's just like, you think life should be, that's how it was, mm -hmm. but over and over uh, selfishness and materialism crept in. People became warlike. They started to try to take over each other. And that, that initial understanding was destroyed. So God had to do this sort of work around to get us back to love and truth that introduced this new thing, which he called the, the ancient church. And so on and on, there's been all these sort of course corrections as people have again and again sort of moved towards this negative stuff. But Swedenborg was convinced and saw a lot of uh, evidence in, in what was happening in the spiritual world that there's this thing coming down the pike, which is he called the new church, which this is sort of the end game for, for all this providence, all this human history, it's leading us towards this, this reconnection to that kind of lost innocence. But, but just like the human being progresses from what Swedenborg calls innocence in childhood to the innocence of wisdom that you can reach in the end of life, which is when you're in childhood, you're, you're sweet and friendly because you don't know any better, right? You don't know anything else but you can get in the innocence of wisdom to be sweet and friendly, even though you know the opposite, right? Because you're choosing, there's this new kind of, and there's the innocence of wisdom. So the human race is moving towards that. You know, we had this idyllic beginning that, that what, where we, you know, that's all we knew, but now we've been through, look, just think about all the stuff in history, all the, the tragedies and us turning the wrong way and all that. We, we, how we've been trying to learn and grow from it. We've, we've been through this life. Now we're moving towards this innocence of wisdom where people are going to be able to, love each other and appreciate each other in a way that can only come with you understanding what it is that that's the opposite of that. So he talks about this new church where people get that the, the spiritual and physical world are back talking to each other again, where, um, where love is the religion and it's spread across the whole world and where everybody knows it's, it's no longer a mystery. Like what, what's going on here. It's, it's just there and, and usefulness is, is all around and everything. And he, he talks a lot about, that's coming. He doesn't say exactly how soon, but he said not too long. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that I can kind of look at in the human race as we kind of seem to be progressing into more sort of love and understanding of each other that I, I think are little symptoms of that mm -hmm. shift happening. Um, but he's very optimistic that, that life is, is really headed somewhere amazing. Um, and it's good. And he, he thinks it's going to stay there once we get there. Wonderful. <laughs> Gertis Charles, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. I'm honoured and delighted and inspired, and I can't re wait to read more about Swedenborg. Swedenborg. Oh, well, that was so fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Curtis. Bye for now. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate, inspirational interviews.